right, good morning, everyone. Just a few announcements for you this morning. We are glad you are here. Um, but we want to let you know about a few things that are going on in the next week or so. First of all, this afternoon at 3 will be the Christian X-Files <coughs> video discussion group at the Whitson's house. So I want to encourage you, um, if you'd like more information or need their address, just go see Steve or Lily. They're both towards the back today instead of up front here like they usually are. But they would be glad to help you with that. And then this Thursday starts our movie days. At 1.30 this week, we'll be uh, watching a movie in the church office on the June calendar, the blue piece of paper out in the entry. If you didn't get that yet, I encourage you to. It lists what that movie is for each week during the month of June. And you'll also note that on one week, there's a change in time, and it'll be movie and dinner. Um, so you'll want to... to Make sure you have that calendar, post it somewhere where you won't forget what is going on. And then something that is not in your bulletin today, but that's important, is next Sunday, we will have the privilege of having Tim and Denise Dunham here in service. They are missionaries that we support from Thailand. Uh, they also happen to be related to Mary Ellen. And so um, we're excited to, to have them here. We'll be hearing from them during the service. And then we're going to have a potluck over at the Chapel Center after the service. So you may have noticed a sign-up sheet as you came in. Ernestine was uh, there with that. And if you haven't had a chance to sign up to bring something, we'll be providing the meats and uh, some buns for barbecue sandwiches. And then we have a sign-up sheet um, asking people if you can bring things like beans or potato salad, coleslaw, you know, all the fixings for a barbecue. So um, if you haven't signed up yet, Make sure you check that out after the service this morning. So with that, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your gracious gifts and for your faithfulness every day. We thank you for the love and care that you show for us, God. And also those gentle nudges that you give us as we um, need your reminders. Reminders of your promises reminders of what you have called us to do and who you have called us to be lord we just thank you for that we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together and worship with one another today and just ask that you would help us set aside anything that might distract us from worship today lord and that you would help us to fully enter into your presence as we worship you we ask this in your name we pray amen Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Um, happy Pentecost Sunday. Aren't you grateful that Jesus, uh, when he ascended, he left the Holy Spirit here for us? So we're going to celebrate that today. As we gather your spirit as we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well there is a host begin to worship. We'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work with you. asked our beautiful organist who you never get to see because she hides behind the organ all the time. I've asked her to do the reading this morning so that you can see what our gorgeous Jan Swan looks like. Thank you. <laughs> if Christ is in you, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. 
If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Join us in worship.
ask that our ushers would come forward. We're going to receive this morning's offering. Thank you so much for being here today. As we do celebrate Pentecost Sunday, we have the opportunity today as Linda's uh, worked so hard at preparing a worship service and so many others behind the scenes that will not only just raise up the Spirit of God, but we invite we invite the Spirit to have complete and free reign. So today, no matter what burdens you bring, no matter what fears, just like the songs that we've sung just now, no matter what burdens, fears, heartaches, or even joys, we're going to lay those at the cross today. We're going to ask you to invite the Spirit of God to fill your life and to bring hope where there's hopelessness, healing where there's hurt, and joy, maybe, where there's a little bit of lacking of that. Father, we thank you for what we're about to receive. We thank you that you give us so much more than we need or deserve. And we ask that you would receive that which we give back to you today. You would multiply it and use it to fulfill the mission you've given the church. But we go forth and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to shine a light in a very dark and hopeless world. Thank you, and we love you. In Christ's name. be seated. This reading is a spirit of truth. It's from John 14, <clears throat> verses 16 through 21, 23, 24, and 26. 
Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things. In that attitude of prayer, join me. Spirit of God, upon my heart. Bring it from earth through all its pulses move. Join me in prayer. Father, we do come before you today through the power of the Holy Spirit, and our needs are many. For those in our family of faith that are sick and ill or just simply could not be with us today, would you be with them? Would your hand be upon them, the healing uh, ointment of your love and grace shower them? For our country, God. Your word tells us that when we don't know how to pray, that within our spirit, you allow, through the spirit of God, groans and mourns to be made that only can happen through a relationship with God. And that's kind of where we're at today, God. We, we just pray for your intervention. We pray that you would work in our country through our leaders Father, we're, we're in a mess, and we openly acknowledge that. But we also proclaim that the King of kings and the Lord of lords has not left the throne. There's nothing that goes beyond your sight. There's nothing that has caught you off guard this week. And there's nothing, nothing that's outside of your power. So we come before you as your children a little bit battered, maybe a little confused, but filled with faith knowing, God, that you are still Lord of Lords. 
As we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit today, would we be energized? Would we be driven to serve you passionately in all of your strength and your glory, not in ours? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. praise God. Good morning again, church. Morning. Welcome. Good, Good, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome as we, and, and you know, it's interesting when we get to Easter, you always hear the pastor or someone say, well, we celebrate Easter every week and we should. And that is very important. And it dawned on me this morning, driving into the office, that why do we not say that more Sunday after Sunday after Sunday about the day of Pentecost? On January 31st, 1933, we as a nation, culturally, however you want to look at, we were introduced to uh, one of those storylines that you just want to hold on to. One of those storylines that you go to and you think, man, that's what it's all about. But the majority of us, and myself included, I really didn't know the backstory to that one character, that one storyline that I enjoyed holding on to as a child and still to this day and many of you grew up holding on to. It's the story of one of six Texas Rangers. They were battling, they were kind of uh, employed to take care of bandits that were, were uh, killing farmers and ranchers, and so they grabbed these six Texas Rangers, and they brought them together, and they were in the midst of doing that, and then Suddenly, one day, they were ambushed. And five of the six Texas Rangers were killed that day. And they dug six graves a few days later. Now, wait, I just said, how many were killed? Five. And how many graves they dig? Is there a, does anyone else see some confusion in this? One still alive. 
What's interesting is they dug that sixth grave. Well, they didn't really dig it, to be honest with you. According to the storyline, by the way, this is not a real story, okay? I don't, I don't want to mislead anyone. This is make-believe. It's fun. They dug the five graves, and they put six crosses out. And before they buried one of the five, someone walked up and cut the shirt off that gentleman before they buried him. Now, I know that sounds like, well, who would do that? Why would you do that? But there's good reason. I'm going to get there in a second. And that sixth ranger wanted to operate in complete secret, anonymity. I don't want anyone to know who I am, and therefore I'm going to have a very good friend put a headstone on, a cross, write my name on it, but I need that shirt. Now, without saying a word, how many of you know who I'm talking about? Three, four, five. Here's how you will know. Who is that masked man? Lone Ranger. Now, you know what's funny is, we, we watch all the black and white movies or Saturday morning shows, but we didn't know really how this guy came into existence. And isn't it an interesting and important that when you know the backstory, you appreciate the story itself of that moment? You, when you know the backstory, by the way, that shirt that was cut off, that's what he made the mask with. The person that drove the cross into the ground and wrote his name on it was his new trusted friend, Tonto. And then in January 31st, 1933, began a whole series of radio and then TV and then black and white movies that I, they're probably countless, who knows. Well, Mitch, what in the world does that have to do with today? I'm glad you ask. Even if you didn't, I'm glad I posed the question to you. Because that's the way we treat the Holy Spirit far too often. You know, in Genesis, we're introduced to God the Father. God that created. And throughout the entire Bible, Bible Genesis through the Revelation we see the interaction of God the Father and what he's doing. And then within the Gospels, we see a promise of God the Son in the Old Testament. But then within the Gospels, we see, and we celebrate this at Christmas, the birth of Jesus. And we, be, we believe we know even where in Bethlehem he was born. Now the reality is, y'all, we don't know the exact cave, okay? says that he was born in a manger, in a stall. The truth is they use caves, and that's what they call the birthplace of Jesus. And by the way, uh, in, when I've been to Israel, I've seen three of the exact places that Jesus was born. <laughs> uh, miles apart, but I've seen them. <laughs> we don't know, but we celebrate that. By faith, we accept the fact that Jesus Christ was born. And by faith, we believe that he was the Son of God, that he lived a perfect life, and he died on a cross for imperfect people like us. And once he was buried, it was kind of like he said, I dare you, devil, to hold me down. And we know that we accept by faith that three days later, he got up, folded his clothes, laid them on the rock, rolled the tomb away, rolled the stone away, and exited the tomb. And then in the Gospels, we are promised multiple times that we would receive a, what? Helper. We'll receive someone that would help us, and, and far too often, it's as if we treat the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, as an add-on. And we don't really strive to know him. On Wednesday night, we had a great uh, Bible study as we began the study of the fruits of the Spirit. But I did camp out 
so I could talk a little bit early on in that study about the person of the Spirit of God. And if you were here on Wednesday, uh, much of this is going to be repeat for you, and that's a good thing. If you miss Wednesday, then we're just giving you a little teaser that we do this every Wednesday, by the way. I want to invite you to come. It's a great time. Hello? And not a lot of commitment there. I like that. Let's not overcommit. The person of the Spirit of God is seen, and again, we celebrate today, Pentecost uh, is 50 days after um, Passover, and today it, we se- it's Pentecost Sunday, and we get to celebrate that. In fact, I'm going to give a, this is a free announcement out for Steve, uh, what's where are you at? What's in? Okay, three o'clock today, right? right. Where? And what's it called? Passover. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Pentecost. Pente- I, well, I was gonna, I was gonna say Passover plus fifty days. That's why I was getting ready to say. That'll be if you want to study the integral parts of that. Steve's offering that today at three o'clock at his house, and if you're at all interested, you really don't want to miss that. What do we know? I mean, simplistically, what do we know? about Pentecost. Well, I'm going to read to you, if you'll let me, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from the heavens a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distinguishing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterances. Well, here's what you need to know when it says they were all together, most Commentators believe that that wasn't just that small group of the apostles and others, but possibly it was about 120 people that were kind of that main following during, uh, during Passover, that there was a larger group. Now, why would that be important? Because of how many people were in Jerusalem at the time. See, there were so many people in Jerusalem And when it says tongues of fire, now, if you, like me, have any Baptist background whatsoever, you try to stay away from that word tongues, because we're afraid of it, all right? It just means like you're crazy Pentecost, you're you're out in left field, and you have absolutely gone ballistic. And the reality is that is not at all what Scripture's saying here. When it says that tongues rested on them, let's say you happen to be in Jerusalem at the time and you are from another region, and they speak not only just a different dialect, they speak a different language. But yet you're in Jerusalem for a celebration, and nobody speaks your language. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit shows up. Here's what's cool. The Holy Spirit shows up, and we need to understand that... Nine out of ten times when God shows up and begins to do something pretty cool, it's noisy and it's messy. And sometimes not necessarily comfortable. I don't know about you, but that's not always a pleasant thought in church, is it? Noisy, uncomfortable. We've never done it that way before, Pastor Mitch. Not that I ever hear that. But, but that is exactly what happened in that upper room. Things that had never taken place before. Things they had never experienced before. Just like the birth of Jesus in the Gospels, the birth of the Holy Spirit lands on planet Earth. And really not the birth of the Spirit. I should say this, in In the Gospels, when we see the arrival of Jesus on this planet, it's the same thing we see here in Acts. It's the arrival. 
of the Holy Spirit. No one had ever experienced like this before. No one had ever, you know, lived through something like this before. But those that were followers of Jesus Christ were automatically given the promise that they had been promised. Think about that. I want to, I'm going to pose a question to you real quick. I had to look at my notes so I didn't mess this up. Um, have you ever been promised something and the promiser didn't follow through with the promise? Think about it. Right or wrong? We have. All. We've all been promised something, and nine times out of ten, it's not that the promiser didn't mean well. It's not that the promiser didn't have their heart in the right place or the right intentions. They just may have overpromised, huh? Overpromised and couldn't follow through with that promise. Lord knows I'm guilty of that at least eight times a day. Oh, man, I'll promise the sky. And then the next day when I've got to deliver the sky, I'm like, man, I should have thought of that one through. We're all that way. So imagine the surprise when they were all together in that upper room and the Lord decides, okay, time to follow through with the gift I promise to give. You know what we can't understand the majority of us? I received Christ as a child. The majority of you in this room may have. And we, we have forgotten what it was like to live in the absence of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's sad when you think about it. Now, I don't ever want to spend a day without the Holy Spirit in my life, and theologically that's impossible. But we forget sometimes the value and the intimacy that we're able to have and the peace we're able to have with the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, some of you that receive Christ as an adult, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly my life was, and, and don't be offended by, by this, it's, uh, I'm using it in a scriptural tense. My life was hell before Christ, because it was. And then when you gave your heart to Christ, the Holy Spirit came into your life, and he's never going to leave, never going to forsake you, no matter how many times you leave him and forsake him, he's there. And we have forgotten what that was like. And perhaps if we understood just who the Spirit was, it would be a little better and easier for us to understand. Again, we often treat the Holy Spirit like the Lone Ranger, some secret person that we were never intended to know. Think about that. Uh, some secret person that we were never intended to know in the exact opposite is true with God. We were intended to know and walk intimately with the Holy Spirit. That is a promise. It's a gift waiting for us to participate in and take advantage of, by the way. How many times have I got to the end of my day and just felt empty and felt bankrupt and and even maybe in a very arrogant moment and disobedient moment, prayed, man, God, I wish that I'd have had the Spirit today more in me. God, I wish that I would have, you, you would have made yourself known a little more to, to me today because it was a bad day. It was a dark day. It was very hollow for me. And then we make the mistake and we pray this. Listen, God, would you tomorrow just give me more of the Holy Spirit? Can I just have a, a double dose of the Spirit? If you, like me, have prayed that prayer, I want to bring us all into check. We need to quit praying that prayer. We don't get more of the Spirit. We ask God, will you bring me to the point that I experience all of the Spirit spirit you've put in my soul 
God doesn't give us more of the Spirit. He's given us all of the Holy Spirit that there is. When we prayed to receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came to reside in a goofy life like mine and yours. And I don't need to pray that God would give me more of that. I need to pray, God, would you put me and allow me to place myself in line so I can walk more intimately with you and enjoy more of the Spirit that you've given me. What does that mean? Well, we have to understand what the Spirit is. Again, we go to Genesis and we recognize there's God the Father. And everything, not that we ever will understand everything, but everything that is encompassed with God the Father. Go to the Gospels and we are introduced and we see the arrival of God the Son. We see the payment he made for our sins how powerful he was over death. And then in Acts chapter 2, we receive the fulfillment of the promise, the Spirit. Uh, The word in the Greek is pneuma, by the way, and that word is, is a really important word because it is one of those words that really is, has a dual application The word pneuma means it's the Spirit of God. Uh, Well, what exactly does that mean, Mitch? Well, it's the third person of a triune God. Now, some of you are thinking, man, I wish he wouldn't, like, get deep. That's not deep, y'all. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of a triune God. I was listening to someone speak one time, and I don't think they meant to do it. We as preachers kind of get ahead of ourselves, and you you saw me run back to my notes. I was afraid I was getting ready to say something incorrect. But we get ahead of ourselves, and we get pretty cocky in preaching, and we'll say something that absolutely is not true, all right? And this pastor, very sound theologically, just a little bit cocky, got ahead of himself, and he said, so... When God created the Holy Spirit to come, and and he never picked up on it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, man, brother. Back up, back, back up, back up. And what's scary is I was not in a big room. It was not filled with a lot of people. But then I started looking around the room. I don't think anyone picked up on it. Not that I was brilliant. I'm not. But I happened to just pick up on the fact that this pastor taught that God created the Holy Spirit as an afterthought. And this will keep you up tonight. The Holy Spirit is not only the third person of a triune God, but he also is co-equal with the Father and the Son. Co-equal. Here's what that means. He's also co-eternal. Now, I know that word may not make sense, and I tried a hundred times to come up with a better word, but God the Father is eternal, amen? So that doesn't mean, and I like to think of it this way, as far forward as I go, I'm going to have God. Guess what else it means? As far back, God existed. If that doesn't keep you up tonight, then you're not thinking. God the Son Far forward as you can imagine, even 100,000 times further than that. But back as well. And God the Spirit, as far back as God the Father, and as far forward as God the Son. He is the third part of the triune God. He is co-equal with the Father and the Son, and he is as eternal as the Father and the Son. What does that mean for us as believers? It means this. The Spirit of God, the pneuma, is in the life of the body of Christ, the agent by which the body of Christ is animated. Think about that. The Spirit of God is that part that gives animation 
to the body of Christ, us as a whole, as a church. I need to really be cautious here. In fact, I wrote in my notes, be careful. So much for careful. Uh, you ever been in a dead, dead church before? Huh? You ever been in a church that, that and not, that I know it doesn't exist here, and I mean that, I'm not just saying that. But I have, I've been in some churches that, I mean, I could use all the cute phrases, the chosen frozen, the, you know, whatever you want to say. I was preaching in a little tiny church in a revival years and years and years ago. And I always tried to take my kids with me. I always tried to bring one of my kids along. One, just so they could see what dad does as an evangelist. But two, it just gave us time to hang out. And it was one of those revivals that started on a Sunday morning and went through Friday night. I preached my heart out Sunday morning, Sunday night, a Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I just preached my heart out. And, you know, most evangelists like to brag about the fact, and we had tens, hundreds, thousands come to know Christ as Savior, rededicate their life to the Lord. Not one. Not one. Uh, there's nothing more discouraging for an evangelist than to get up and extend that altar call and no decisions. We got Friday night. And, and I had all my messages planned out in advance. And they were, I had practiced, I had prepared, I had prayed up. I think, I believe with all my heart, the pastor had prayed up. I believe that just the church had been, got into a rut where they were not going to listen to the Spirit of God. That too many people showed up with bitterness in their heart or anger for someone across the aisle. And event after event after event just stifled the Spirit of God from working. And y'all churches, we have to be careful of that. If we do not stay on top of that, we will see the, the work of the Spirit of God begin to diminish and be squelched. And on Friday night, I preached my heart out. I looked over at the music minister and he started that altar call. And you know, as, again, as an evangelist, we're pretty much set on, you play just as I am about 14 verses, then God will do something. I went to him that night, and I said, hey, Blake, let's be careful. What do you mean? Let's not drag out the inevitable. Mitch, I can't believe you just said that. I don't act like you're not discouraged, Blake. I know you are. Let's just do just as I am, and we're going to leave them just as they are, and we're not going to shake, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to mess with it. We're not going to mess with it. So, he begins, everybody's standing, and we're singing. And God forgive me, I'm going to be transparent with you. I was like, two more verses. One more verse. And in that last verse, all of a sudden there was a stir in the audience. And they're looking around because someone had begun to move, but I can't see who's moved. And I look at the back of the row, the very back of the church. And it, again, there was like 50 people maybe. But who steps out into that center aisle but my youngest son, Brad. Now, he already knew Christ as a Savior. So I'm thinking as he comes down the aisle, the Lord's called my son to be a missionary <laughs> at eight years old. Praise the Lord. He comes down the aisle, and I, I'm not going to do it. I can't get down on one knee and get back up without help. But I got down on one knee where we're face to face, and oh, the room was, oh, they were, it, they were so excited. And I put my arm around me. He put his arm right here on my, my shoulder. And I said, Brad, you okay? And he said, yeah, Dad, I just, somebody had to do something this week, and I, I just, I said, do what? 
He said, somebody had to do something. And he said, but can I ask you a question? Okay, now it is going to turn spiritual. What? On the way back to the hotel, could we stop by to Wiener Sissel? <laughs> That's Mona's child, by the way, all right? <laughs> and I said, Brad, we can, and you're an encouragement to me. But I, two things. One, this is sacred time. And he said, I know it is. I'm not trying to make it not sacred. He's an eight-year-old trying to process. And I said, well, I'm going to pray with you. And before I could pray, he said, but we're still stopping at the Wiener Stitch, all right? <laughs> so we prayed. And he said, I'm going to go back to my seat. And I said, oh, no, you're not. You're standing right here with me. Thanked everybody for what a great time we had had. And I said, my son and I were able to pray together tonight. We just thank you for letting us be here. I didn't say what we prayed about. We did pray. We prayed about God's grace on the church and his life. And, but the body is animated by the spirit and, and us working within the spirit. And if you show up at church and it feels cold, and if you show up at church and it feels like there's nothing going on, could possibly you be part of the problem? Did you show up with your heart in the right place? Did you come prayed up, confessed up? Have you made right with those in this room? Even if it's not your fault, did you try to make right with those in this room saying, I... I don't want us to stifle what God wants to do in our midst. Church doesn't have to be cold. It doesn't have to be quiet. It doesn't have to be like we've always done it before. We could show up and say, Spirit of the living God, all fresh on me. The pneuma not only gives animation to the body, gives animation to the body. You ever feel like you're walking through life and you're just going through the motions and it's not making sense? And you don't know where that power is. You know you know Christ is your Lord and Savior. When is the last time you did exactly what I asked you to do before you come to worship? You pray up. You confess up. And you just simply ask God, I am not perfect. I am not everything I wish I was, nor you wish I was. But today, today, God, would you do something unique in my life so I can love or bless someone else through your power and your grace? That's the pneuma. The Spirit does that for us. When they were all in that upper room, that room together, Everyone came together. And there became a wind and a rattling. And the Spirit fell on them. If we're going to we're going to experience the Spirit in its fullness. We've got to go to the cross. We've got to go back to the cross and celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ died so he could fulfill the Spirit. Linda's going to lead us in a song, and then we're going to have the Lord's Supper. We're just going to sing one verse, and uh, I want to invite you to go ahead and stand and stretch, but make this, please make this a prayer. And then right after we sing, we're going to celebrate Communion together, recognizing that there was a body broke and there was blood shed so we could have the Spirit of God in our lives. Please stand. No, you don't need to stand. It's, no. a, it's a special number. <laughs> <laughs> to 
Praise God. Praise God. It's gorgeous. Our servers are going to come forward. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. They gathered for the love feast, and he really just mimicked what they did in the book of Luke. Paul said, For as received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as, as you drink in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the body. We thank you for the blood. We thank you that you give us a chance to celebrate. Only you, God, only you can take something as simple as a wafer and juice and remind us 
of the eternal sacrifice that was made. So, Father God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we thank you in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. We were given the body, and we were given the blood. Take and eat all of it. I hope my prayer is that this week, 
you will seek out living the, in the fullness of the Spirit of God. What a great week it'll be if every day we wake up before our feet even touch the ground and ask God, God, give me the ability to walk in the fullness of your Spirit, sharing the love of Christ to the world the Father has created. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you, lift his countenance upon you. And in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may the Lord God give you peace. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.